when you talk about documentaries and passion, what exactly do you do? Do you produce them, invest in them, <laughs> film them? Yeah, or... I, I, I'm, a, I'm a venture capitalist because I'm not creative. Okay. Phil, you're giving me too much, too much credit. I, I, I'm, merely, I'm merely a consumer. Uh, it probably started at this point, uh, I want to say 14 years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, probably 12, 14 years ago, I started uh, using... Uh, documentaries, whether they're amateurly produced or independently produced, um, to just catch myself up on parts of the world I knew nothing mm -hmm. about um, and, and doing so in a manner that was pretty enjoyable. Right? One of the benefits of most documentaries is you often don't even have to look at the screen. And it was my like lazy man's way of podcasting to myself. I mean, back <laughs> when I was in high school and younger. Um, and it soon became addicting, right? For an hour, you get to step in the shoes of an individual or an event or a country or a culture, whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and that has grown. So I, I used to be much more disciplined about, it. I used to have a spreadsheet with about like 400, 500 names that I'd watched over the years. And now it's just, uh, now I don't get the opportunity to just stare off into a screen for two hours every single day, the way you do when you're, you know, 16 years old or whatever. Um, so that, that has, that has long since endured. And I actually think probably maybe about now seven or eight years ago with the reemergence of vice and a mm -hmm. few other of these HBO kind of more modern documentaries kind of brought it back to the forefront. I think actually quite a few people, I think about Free Solo and a few others, uh, documentaries have actually become kind of part of like pop culture and common culture now. So I'm no longer the, the weird uh, documentary obsessed kid. Uh, I get to get to fit in with everyone else. Oh, what's the name of the guy uh, from uh, Loop Insurance, the co-CEO? I think that he came from Vice and he also was a venture capitalist. Forgot his name now. Oh, I had... I had that I, I, it seems like he and I might be best friends. I'm surprised uh, we haven't run into each other. Amazing. I think he's... Brooklyn or Bronx or something like that. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Uh, it could yeah. be. No, which is, you know, when I moved to Los Angeles, I said, it has nothing to do with documentaries. It's like, okay, <laughs> I'm moving from New York to Los Angeles. I need to have something, some sort of a social hook that I can talk with people here. So I invested in, a, in an indie movie comedy. And so I have an IMDb entry as a producer. There yeah, we go. Yeah, no, I'm very excited about it. It's you can buy uh, what? Uh, wow, I forget the name of the film. That's uh, oh, the California No. You can okay. you can buy the California No on Amazon Prime. I think. <laughs> I think. Not really sure, but yeah. So let let's talk about insurance and funds and what do you what do you think? What's interesting now for you? Man, I think, uh, I feel like the, the world has changed. I know. Right? I think maybe two, two or three years ago, it was like everyone was biting their nails to figure out what was going to happen with carriers when they went public. Um, and now in a weird way, we, we kind of know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you have the answer of this question that we've all been guessing about for eight, 10 years. And now you're like, okay, what do I do with this? Um, and so in, 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 you know, we, I've seen some people say, look, you know, I'm not going to do any stuff with carriers. I'm just going to go for infrastructure. I've seen other folks say, you know, actually, I know exactly what that carrier did wrong. I can fix it. Our gross margin is going to be better. Our loss ratios are going to be better. Um, but what, what I'm really excited about is the general maturity of the space. Mm -hmm. I think you, you have to have the first handful of high growth, raise too much money companies. You have to get them out of the way before you start working on kind of second and third order problems um, and, and, and new, new spaces. Uh, I think, you know, you and I have just talked about this, but you know, I've been playing around with kind of crypto and you know, cyber insurance for crypto theft uh, as, as a concept. We've looked at some new applications for kind of, uh, you know, gig work or modern commercial insurance for individuals that are both kind of owner operators um, and broadly thinking about this dichotomy between tackling new categories and wanting to give coverage to people who need it, um, but underwriting in a responsible way uh, and doing that in an environment like venture where growth is king. Like how, how do you how do you marry those two ideals, right? You want to underwrite diligently and carefully in categories that no one's ever touched, um, but you also want to be growing three hundred percent year over year. Uh, and so that that's what I've been kind of racking my brain about for the past few months or a year. Yeah. So so maybe I'll start from the the the, the kind of nexus, right? Which is. You know what, what's been guiding our philosophy in uh, in insurance now for you know the nine years we've been around. I, I think the initial and the fundamental thought is that in financial services you can 
tackle one of two or both problems. The first is the distribution of that financial problem. And the second is the product itself. Um, and I think we've largely found in categories where the only thing that's being disrupted is the distribution. It ends up being a rather capital intensive and brand oriented customer journey. Um, and those for the most part are less interesting to us, uh, not entirely uninteresting, but less interesting just because I think um, neither our insurance nerd brains or our technology brains end up being used in those journeys. Um, there are phenomenal brand investors and individual kind of consumer retail investors who've done a great job picking the financial services brands, whether it's in fintech or insure tech that have done kind of phenomenally well. Um, because of our orientation to technology uh, as opposed to kind of brand as we think, think about investing, we've specifically looked at opportunities where kind of tech and data are the reason you succeed. Um, and that can either be because tech and data enables you to identify customer, customers that other people aren't able to identify or serve them in some ways that other people can't, or in insurance specifically, you're able to underwrite and service them better. Um, so because of that, the initial wave of insure tech carriers, we'll call it, you know, the Oscars and, and, and whomever, um, they tended to not be a fit with our thesis. And so we specifically focused on like true infrastructure a kind of SaaS that was selling to carriers. And that universe is infinitely hard, right? You have you know, policy administration systems and claims management systems. We were early investors in Snapsheet. That was one of the few plays that we, we saw and kind of that's grown to scale. Um, over time though, what's been pretty amazing as you know, alternative data sources have not just emerged, but the ability to harness them and underwrite them has come to pass. We've been actually able to make some carrier investments. Um, and as a carrier, loosely speaking, I mean, MGAs and MGUs. Um, and we've been able to do that in Mulberry, which is doing warranty insurance um, at the point of sale um, and kin insurance, uh, which, which kind of you, you mentioned before, and, and they're able to underwrite and you know, a hard to underwrite customers using satellite data instead of zip codes um, and places where technology are the reason you end up winning in the long term. Um, I think as we look to the future um, a, a, about kind of areas of insurance, and I think we, you kind of mentioned this, is, uh, you know, for us, we continue to think about kind of categories that can be cracked with science, as opposed to categories that just have seeming product market fit. I think the beauty of insurance, one of the interesting things, much like lending, is that giving away money has infinite product market fit, right? Giving people insurance for things they're scared about has infinite product market fit. The question is whether you can be right in the long run. Um, and so there are a bunch of emerging categories that are maybe derivatives of existing categories. Um, but for us, as we're ticking through and seeing which ones of them we're excited about, we think about technology being a differentiating point. And that's actually how we landed on health. Uh, I think health is one of those like boogeymen in the world of insure tech VCs. There's not enough uh, conversation that goes about around health tech. And part of that is because of, you know, large carriers being kind of monoliths and there, there being monopolies and things like that. Um, but the reality is when we've looked at it, we've kind of picked apart health insurance much the same way we would have done PNC and others. And we've broke it down in the life cycle. And we've actually noticed that because of the volume of data, um, there's actually like math is the answer, right? So whether it's Precision GX kind of using their own home built correlation model to figure out whether or not uh, a certain medical bill being submitted to a health insurance carrier has been improperly billed. Um, or something like Amino, which is on helping self-administered health plans inside of large organizations actually use technology to service uh, end consumers, um, helping them discover, schedule, book, and then pay um, all in one kind of unified app. So that, that continues to be the lens that we look at the world in. Um, and, and I'll pause there, but you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned health because it, it is something that we're, we're quite excited about. It is very interesting. And I love, listen, I bring that up because... That it's it's it cries. Hey, look at me. We've been neglecting, and it's funny enough that you brought Oscar as like the first uh, example there because they've done a lot of fundraising and been relatively successful in terms of where they are today. And we always hear complaining. And that's something that I see also if it's um, in short to connect and others that all the love goes to PNC. Then you have from time to time a little yep. bit of life, and even within life, not all the products get uh, attention. For right. now, it's really limited to term. Um, there are yep. a few that I would say one that I can think about that is going to conquer the whole life and universal life from a digital uh, touch point. And then there is, you know, I know it is a long-term care, disability, etc. that is almost ignored completely. 
Usually yeah. they say, oh, it's too complex. You need to explain. It's very hard. But no, it's the distribution. It's the selling part of annuity. You need to explain that that uh, financial vehicle. What does it mean to the customer? And you cannot yeah. go like, so basically, are you afraid for your life? Do you care about uh, your relatives? <laughs> Let me fear you about your death. Uh, so yeah. please buy this product. Now, with health, there is so much to do. I remember the, when I yeah. moved to the US, uh, I, actually, even now, so many years later, I'm still not sure how to work with my, you know, with my physician or different caregivers or yeah. health care providers. And it's still not sure you're in the network, outside of the network. Then you actually care about it and try to figure out how it operates. The relationship between the insurance, the physicians, the hospitals, it's such yeah. a mess, which of course means for us yeah. amazing opportunities. <laughs> you're, you're totally right. One of, one of the, the best analogies or like arguments I've heard is that healthcare is a retail experience that tries desperately hard not to be retail. Right? There's an emotional, you know, you don't want to view your physician as a merchant, but they are, right? They provide a good or service that you pay for, except in the modern ecosystem, you often are an involuntary customer, you know, paying a hospital through a third party discounted by a fourth party that you're getting from a fifth party, which is your employer. It's the most convoluted mess. Um, and, and it has left so many people uninsured, right? Like as, as much as we kind of, you know, uh, hyper analyze insurance, like you know, insurance is a social good, right? It enables you to live your life in a day-to-day -day way that like few other financial products actually enable you to do. Um, and health has got to be the biggest dissonance between like need and coverage. Um, certainly with high deductible health plans and a, and a handful of other things. Um, the challenge though, which you were actually really well articulated is with, you know, PNC, PNC life is easier, right? It's government mandated for your, you know, car or insurance mandated for your, like, you know, or your mortgage or requires it whatnot. And there's effectively one stakeholder. There's like you, the insurance company and your house. Um, and as a result, finding tools and solutions that work in the environment are easier because there's fewer dependencies. With health, if you're trying to find a solution for a end consumer to be able to get care, you have to find a solution that works for the employer, the carrier, the provider, the, the payment method. There's so many people and so many pieces to crack. Um, and I think that's why so many, the first group of people were like, we're just going to build all of it. Right. And so you have folks like Oscar and, and Bright Health were like, we're going to buy the clinics and we're going to be the insurance company. We're going to build our EMR because everything was broken. And, I, and again, you're, you're thankful for people who go and do that journey. But I think that, you know, there, there's kind of a lot to do on the technology piece, which is like fixing what is broken, uh, as opposed to just saying, hey, we're going to create our own parallel universe uh, somewhere else. Both are respectable, but we're, we're certainly drawn to the, the former rather than the latter. Well, I, I think that's about, first of all, most people we know we uh, let let me rephrase that because we can enter COVID into that. We live based on anecdotal facts. For us mm. as a population, it's hard to grasp what does it mean when you have seven hundred thousand new COVID day infections, and yeah. how is that going to impact our life? We know that the cousin of all the friend or the entire family or oh my flight was cancelled. We, we can understand that impact and how our friend's family got infected directly if some of them was actually sick, right? We, we know mm -hmm. that, we see it, it's a fact. But to think about it in an abstract or at the scale of a population, it's super hard for us. And, no, yeah. and I would say a, f a few individuals, well, um, thousands of individuals that manage those systems know the impact and how it's going to cascade uh, or waterfall yep. on everyone. And with that also, health system and insurance. Yeah. Because while we are talking about PNC and the commodity products, you have all kinds of specialties that are not really commodity. They are a little bit harder. Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, in, in order to do the underwriting, it's a little bit more complicated. And sadly, it's not really scalable. Vivek, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself and about a commerce fund, co a commerce ventures? Yeah, happy, happy to do. 
Commerce Ventures. Yeah, happy to do it. Yeah, we are. First of all, thank you for having me. My pleasure. Uh, I love the show. So excited to be part of it. But uh, yeah, happy to share. I mean, the, the you know we're we're, we're kind of quick and easy. We're a nine year old venture capital fund. We manage about two hundred and sixty million dollars across four funds, um, investing in the places that we're obsessed with. Uh, for us, that's three categories: it's retail, financial services, and insurance. Um, and our thought process is people operate their lives pretending that each of these three things are a solid category of life, whereas most things that where you spend money are retail transactions that should be insured in some way, or fundamentally you need security in your life. Um, and so we have invested in about 100 companies over the past nine years, I'd say probably with a 65% bend towards technology and infrastructure, mm -hmm. and maybe a 35-ish percent bend towards full stack kind of financial services across insurance and financial services. Um, this is my fifth year at the fund. I come after a few years of misspent, you know, youth in a windowless room doing investment banking, that too in FinTech and InsurTech over at FD Partners. Um, but even back then, right, I had the, you know, my, the first transaction I ever worked on was in Servio, uh, which sold to Solera, which is, you know, claims data to figure out whether or not someone's making a fraudulent claim. And I worked there when we did the Square Trade uh, deal to, to Alst Allstate and had the pleasure of, now, this is year seven, effectively, of, of insurance and insurtech. Uh, and as we were talking before, like, what a journey, yeah. right? Like from, you know, the, the term was being minted like eight to 10 years ago to now you have a fleet of public companies. Mm -hmm. Say what you will about performance, but a fleet of them that, that you know. Uh, yeah, we should you know, talk about reflecting that. Reflecting the actual Because. Yeah, just a generation of investors and operators. So It sorry. is. And we see second and third generation. So. If we we talked about in, in infrastructure, Coterie, it's a second and third uh, founders. Um, Inaki from uh, Cover Wallet, I know, I knew him. Oh my God! Yeah. I knew him when he was uh, um, what was it? The one that is sold to Singatel. Um, his first startup um, back in New York. So, you know. He already that so that was his third day exit, and now he he has his own fund that he announced I think last week or earlier this week. We see a lot of more and more capital coming into the industry yeah. to fund amazing ideas and solutions. Because let's face it, there is there is still a blue ocean to conquer here, For and sure. we are. Yeah. Cheap. He does. He does. He also does a great job of identifying phenomenal Spanish talent. Oh yeah, <laughs> time and time again. So. Uh, we'll give him shout out and listen. The man is is a poster, uh, a, I don't know, a model that, you know, Oxford or Cambridge, PhD from Oxford or Cambridge, marathon yeah. runner, three-time exe, a fan now. Come on. <laughs> so, someone just give him a prize yeah. and tell him to stop trying so the rest of us can succeed. Exactly. <laughs> oh, this is where you need to inspire to. But come on, man. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Okay, and that was enough love to enough. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, one of the things that we've been, I think we, you and I were, were kind of going back and forth on, right, is in the context of like where we've been spending time, you know, how do you think about the emergence of new mm -hmm. lines, right? Um, and, and there's a, I read this really interesting kind of like tweet article effectively that was taking a pretty controversial point, which is that you actually can't invent new lines in insurance in traditional ways. Um, and the argument is that like, in a world where you don't have actuarial tables, right? You basically, you, you're, or you can't do it in a responsible way. If you don't have actuarial table, you basically have to be able to raise enough money to eat losses for long enough for you to figure mm -hmm. out like what exists and what doesn't. Then in that context, like, gosh, being a seed investor in this venture market where you're taking, you know, you're doing 50 pre on a pre-seed, it makes it, it's, it's really hard. Uh, and so uh, that that's kind of the new challenge, right? It's like, do you, do you believe that cyber will be widely available? Do you believe that parametric will be widely available for things that aren't catastrophe? Um, and of course, like how much are those things worth? So yeah. like, those, those are all the things that we're kind of racking our brains. And to that, uh, Michael, Micro insurance, what does it mean? How does it affect? Well, at, the, at a certain point, it's much easier because you see the turnaround faster. With parametric, it's interesting because the statistics ideally should be there so you can build those uh, tables because right. it's parametric, but then we can tie it back to what we sort of touched earlier. What does it mean to crypto? The 
definition of decentralized insurance. And uh, let's completely yeah. differentiate between decentralized insurance and an insurance policy for crypto, because right. what does it mean? So far, I've seen a few of them. I was talking to uh, Mika Cooper, who's been running his backend on blockchain for several years now for efficiency and standardizing uh, uh, the backend of his operation, standardizing data. But that's not what we are talking about when we are dealing with with crypto. Where, where are we yeah. now with that? Is it about the transactions? Is that cyber? Where? Yeah, I, I, th I think you draw a really good delineation, right? There's like blockchain insurance, right? So think about title, right? Using the blockchain to create an indelible record of insurance and coverage and all of that. And then there's insurance for crypto assets. Mm -hmm. And I think insurance for crypto assets is effectively cyber insurance, yep. right? It, I, my, my understanding, my limited understanding is that um, predominantly the number one loss driver is theft. So digital maneuverability and theft. Um, and from ha talking to a handful of companies in that space, you know, if you ask their, you know, you ask them like what their underwriting criteria is, it's actually more of us, they hire, hire a team of cybersecurity specialists to do a full scale analysis of your enterprise and say, hey, your employees handle their devices irresponsibly. They connect to the internet through uh, kind of risky Wi-Fi channels. They're likely to be hacked. There's exposure here. Do these things and we can lower your premium. I think blockchain on the insurance is a, is a different, categorically disruptive thing, right? Particularly in the context of like subrogation and settling claims between multiple parties. Like that is a different beast. And I think um, because it requires multi-party buy-in and insurance is insurance will take mm -hmm. forever. Uh, I'm, I'm far less excited about that uh, in the next three to five years. I think one of the hardest things about insurance is that nobody wants it, <laughs> right? Um, crypto is so amazing because it's the first time in a category people are begging for it. Even cyber insurance, which like you and I and others have known is important. Talk to your average SMB owner and they go, well, I know I don't want to get a hack. I have no idea how much I just spend. Talk to anyone that owns crypto institutionally. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, who can I give this risk to? Yep. And so I think it's one of the most unique moments in insurance history where you have a product that people are craving. Now the question is, before we give it to them, can we actually be responsible? And do we know what we're giving them? I think that's the more interesting kind of leaf to turn over. Hey, it's a great question because, you know, broke it down and hopefully we can clarify it a little bit more, the difference between the infrastructure, uh, the different insurance program, and the fact that in terms of timing, it's great. There is so much buzz about crypto and more about, well, it's super hard to sell insurance, as you just said, to SMBs. Now, how do you sell them cyber insurance that is focusing on their crypto assets or their wallet? Because as an individual, okay, you may have it in a Coinbase, a Binance, wherever that may be. Is that your personal? Is that the business? Who is actually dealing, right? Who has that electronic yeah. wallet? Is that your personal or is that the business? Are you receiving coins or tokens? Yeah. So that will be that type of insurance. Then, of course, when we look yeah. at the exchanges that I'm sure there is all kinds of different regulations out there, is that going to be sort of an SIPC? Speaks, yeah. Or a FIDC? Most likely I'm, I'm misspelling those <laughs> the letters here. And if there is, are we going to cover you with to $50,000 based on if something happens to the exchange to save that account? What is the solution yeah. that is going to be there, which is very interesting because it, it's going to be very heavy on the regulators, uh, more or less, to set it up. Um, and beside that, it's like, what else? If we are taking the next step for uh, DEINS or decentralized insurance, is that a new peer-to-peer -peer solution? I, yeah. I don't know. I, I'm like more or less trying to segment it and trying to figure out who is going to pick it and what's the next insurance, I don't know, amazing startup, crypto startup. Yeah, I, I, that's the question. Like, again, I think the magic is that the good news is the, the one thing that every other category of financial services mm -hmm. have, which is product market fit. Yeah. Finally, insurance has with crypto. So that's awesome. Um, I think that the next step, though, is... The way I think about, particularly in the commercial application, what you just mentioned, is that there's stages, right? There's places where, for sure, individual crypto ownership, unclear, 
Um, I don't believe that individuals tend to have enough crypto that they're thinking about insurance. A small portion do, and they'll get custom policies uh, made by you know, Chubb and others to help them. Um, I think at the top of the line, you have folks like Fidelity mm -hmm. who will be storing crypto and they're going to have to say, gosh, we just have way too much exposure. We're going to need policy. And I think there will be some category of company that solves that and that specifically. Uh, almost if you remember even, and, and there'll be derivatives, right? So there'll be the insurance company. And if you remember Science, which Guidewire acquired, yep. which is helping people understand their cyber exposure, there will be people who say, gosh, you know, asset manager, why? You don't even know how many of your wealth advisors have parked their customers' assets into crypto. That's all being brokered by either your accounts or you have some exposure uh, you're going to need. So you're, there's going to be an information and data layer helping folks figure out kind of where their exposure is, and then there'll be insurance to help solve that. The question you asked, which is really interesting, is right in the middle. Those SMBs and SMEs who have like personal and business crypto, and this is now we're talking 20, 30 years yeah. in the future, right? There's a version of the world where, you know, crypto is being used not as an investment asset, but actually as kind of commodity tokens for, you know, me buying a sandwich at the grocery store. Uh, that is going to be really interesting because the theft percent or the, the thievability, that's probably not a word, but the ability to steal from those places will be quite high. Um, and so the risk will be quite me meaningful. Um, and, and there's going to have to be an interesting way of convincing these business owners to, to actually insure. Um, that I think would be a huge winner uh, in, in the category, but we're probably 20 years away from product market fit there, I think. Oh. Whereas in the top and the bottom of the market, maybe- Oh, we're going to see other things much faster. Really depends on metaverse and all the other virtual or digital assets. Right. It doesn't matter NFTs or most likely it may run on that uh, blockchain if it's uh, on ETH or others, because it will be a question, how do I make sure that I'm the owner? And maybe yeah. if you see all kinds of digital assets going on the metaverse, how do you make, it's going to be owned by a business. How do you keep that yeah. from being stolen? And if someone is going to shout, hey, it's on the blockchain, we know it's a, do we know it? It's like, it's supposed to be, yeah. do, because I'm sure that there is like an NSA or someone who already figure out all the addresses of all the wallets and all the uh, know your customer. <laughs> it's everything is mapped while it's supposed to be anonymous, but you know, yeah. if someone really wants, they will figure it out. They will figure it out. You, you, that, like that's another interesting application, right? Which is um, again, delineating just for folks who are listening <laughs> and desperately trying to follow, follow you, you and my like crazy rant here, right? There's, there's the insurance of the crypto asset and totally separately. Yes. There is the leverage of blockchain technology to make insurance as an industry more efficient. Um, the, the, the latter, which is kind of using blockchain technology, I think is fat, there, there's two places that I think of, uh, as really interesting applications to just like talk through and show how, how much power it can have. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who's the head of engineering at a, um, at kind of a machine learning startup. And he was, he was saying, you know, I, I don't, you know, crypto doesn't, blockchain doesn't make sense to me. Uh, anything, anything blockchain can do a great database could do. Um, and I, and at the moment I was like, you know, that's an interesting point. And then group. until you start thinking about web three, which, which is the ownership and the centralization of the data. Um, and I look at two places where the centralization of data valuable to insurance is kind of like ruined lives. Um, what one in a more annoyance way and one in a real, real way, let's take an annoyance first. Let's look at title planning. Mm -hmm. You want to close your home. And you just want to know who, how, who owned the house before you. You're in that person's home, buying the home from them. And you need the title company to tell you that the person selling you the home is actually the owner of the home, right? And they guard that data closely and they charge people massive amounts of money for it to gain access. It adds 10 days to your process and costs you $3,000. Imagine it is not necessarily that they couldn't just move onto a database. It's that you don't trust the title company to not be milking you for money instead of just giving you the answer mm -hmm. and a decentralized database where you can see the ownership property ownership of homes over time would give you that in a more pernicious way you look at health data right so these databases the emrs have all of this data that you need for value-based healthcare. you move from california to or you you move you know, from new york to la you have your medical records there right now you have a physician that's got to call epic because he's on cerner there's 
three weeks of data delays or charging people. And even though there's been a federal law that says that all of the, the, the EMRs have to make their data publicly available, they are intentionally, if I did a query on Gilad, I would get 400 pages intentionally complicated. The PDFs will be faxed sideways just so I can't actually understand it. They can't be trusted with that data for making insurance decisions and health decisions. Right. And being able to get retrieve a physician that sees you in the ER, being able to immediately get access to your medical records without having to go through a for profit third party. It's a really fascinating application of what that could mean for insurance specifically. You opened the door to so many different things. And I really wanted to jump back to performance and what does and how. Uh, the different exits that we've seen in the PNC side impact uh, the life of funds and how they invest. Uh, but let's close the health part, and especially because it's infrastructure. Sure. You mentioned Epic, which sometimes I feel mm-hmm. like they are keeping, they are trying to keep their monopoly or a uh, hegemon. Hegemon. How do you? Hegemon. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Yeah. I think I was thinking about the, the hegemon um, uh, from a, wow, this, I need to cut this stuff out. Um, and there's game. So his brother was the hegemon and all that line of them. Oh, well, it's a hegemon. It's a hegemon. Great reference. A great rapper. I haven't heard about Ender's Game in quite some time. Phenomenal book. Oh, listen, yes, if, if you love, I, I would say that uh, Ender's Shadow series is a little bit better. L- loved it. The, the, the one that follows yep. being uh, incredible. Yeah. In- incredible. Yeah. And, you no, know, I, I think I think what you're getting at is like in a world where these guys have all the data and they have monopolistic control, like what do you do? Like what, what is the pathway to releasing that data enabling carriers to be able to underwrite on that data. I think there's there's two ways. The first is the blow it up way. And there's like the actual, like let's play within the rules. But I think about people playing within the rules, the company that I've, I've heard great things about and I have a ton of respect for the team is Health uh, And there's others, there's Particle Health, there's Pluto Health, there's people who are basically creating uh, data piping. They say, look, we will take that 400 pages that Epic sends us. We'll use OCR and our own intelligence to be able to curate that and extract just the data that you want. And we'll put it in a lockbox and you can access it whenever you want. Um, so if you've gotten a COVID test, I think in the state of California, uh, but certainly in San Francisco, um, there's an organization here called City Health. I'll go get a COVID test and Health Gorilla will deliver my lab results even before they do. Um, they're able to pipe me the data in, instantaneously. It's a, it's a really awesome experience. Um, well, the reason I brought it up, it's more about the decentralization. It was a continuation of decentralizing the information and the data and making the, just a continuation of your example of title. What does it mean and how it impact our life, especially when it comes to health, right? Yeah, yeah. That, was the, that was the point. Yeah. There we go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I think that there it's a much it's a much harder thing, right? Because I think the notion of decentralization is you have to go and get pretty much every hospital mm-hmm. on board. <laughs> it's a, this is the kind of blow it up option. You have to get every single stakeholder on board to be able to share that information directly. Um, and good luck, right? Like you have different formats and different like the, the, the sprawl is quite quite large, but that's what that looks like. I think that's what that looks like, where you go to individual provider organizations and have that share data into effectively a consortium and individual owners, meaning you and I, owners of our own data have full read, write authority. We can pull down that data. We can share it. New physicians can alter that data and then reshare it back. And that's law on some type of, kind of again, indelible chain. Um, it's a beautiful idea. It's hard to, it's hard to imagine that happening in short. Okay. Time. So for the people of Gal- who are still listening to this, or watching that. So let me clarify a couple of things. First of all, we were not ranting about anything. On the contrary, we were pointing at different opportunities. That's one. Now let's jump and talk back about the PNC. You're investing in financial institutes, in insurance, real estate, everything is meshed together. I'm a build.com a consumer, and that's not a sponsorship. Uh, if they want to sponsor me, more than welcome. Um, <laughs> not me, the, the podcast. Um, 
So let's talk about performance and how the latest public uh, offering impact how you perceive the investment because things change in the past seven years. Right. Yeah. And we can ignore Kin for now because they are one of your portfolio companies. So what do you think? We've seen, you know, Hippo, we Lemonade, yeah. Root, uh, a few others that basically lost between 50 to 80 percent of the value. I think that the last time I checked, Hippo is now uh, trading at a 2.5. Five two point four dollars a, yeah. a share, which is ten percent of the IPO. No, mm. no, no. They the IPO the ten and ten dollars. Ten yeah, yeah. ten dollars. Yeah. Uh, Root was at uh, twenty five. It, it's it's a really interesting. Again, we're kind of all grappling with what this means. I think. I look at it and I, it seems to rhyme, if you will, with the first generation of fintech IPOs, mm -hmm. lending IPOs, on deck, lending club. And these are effectively distribution oriented businesses that didn't focus either on unit economics or defaults in lending. Same thing here as being unit economics and loss ratios. Um, and I, I think what we found is public markets are willing to forgive if your growth continues to be astronomical and your losses tend to be moderate. They're, they're willing to turn a blind eye to fundamental unit economics if the growth doesn't slow down at all. You probably get like two or three quarters of grace before they say, hey, you're not growing like a technology company anymore. And your unit economics certainly don't look like a technology company, but a little And then when I look at you compared to other carriers, your loss ratio is actually as high. What, what am I doing? Uh, and that's where we're seeing the pullback in quarter two, quarter three. Mm -hmm. Lemonade has uniquely been able to avoid that more so than, than Root and others. And I think part of it is they've made some smart acquisitions. They've used their super high multiple to buy stuff at low multiples and, and arbitrage up. Um, they also have Unbalanced, to be honest, a simpler product, like renters graduating to homes is, is nice. very different than, 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 than others. But even then, you know, I actually was spending some time looking through their S1, right? Like they're, they, they have a very interesting way of quoting. They say, you know, 10% of our homeowners base comes from uh, our renters. And that the way you, you go, oh, that's, that's pretty impressive. But it, it's actually, that, it's not that of all the renters, 10% convert. It's actually that, you know, probably 1% of their existing base is actually graduating into a new policy. They're just, the, the N is so small that it happens to be 10% of homeowners. And so even there, I think we'll enter this LTV question. They're going to get a year, maybe more of kind of either they have to buy something that dramatically increases the LTV of their customers, which they might be doing with Metromont and a few others, or they have to improve their graduation rate. And I think across the board, as kind of these companies start to look more and more like mid-sized carriers, I think they'll trade in a similar way. I think, and you mentioned Kin, so I'll, I'll, I'll say what I, what I can. I think the people who will get really exciting valuations, now will they be 40 times run rate or 100 times premium? I, I don't know. And I wouldn't purport to know in public markets. But where I, where I do think people tend to be excited is where you can maintain growth, your margins are sustainable, and you have an unequivocally lower loss ratio than average. And you have reinsurers that are not constantly pulling out. And I think if you have those four things, the public market will give you a premium for sure relative to existing carriers, even high performing carriers like Progressive. I, I think there is a general market question about whether that's 15 times progressive or 20 times progressive or three. And I think that's a, that's a question for public markets to figure out. And so let me so, almost repeat the question in a different way, because here's the, I don't know, the eyebrows that go when they go up. It's, we've seen the, the results. You actually read the S1s and you, you can articulate and understand the logic behind it, but most people don't. Most people look at the, uh, the cut of the, sharp, uh, of the share price. At the same time, they look at that the capital and the number of funds, the venture yeah. capital that is going into this industry doubled itself. So last year, so 2021, we're talking about a, almost $14 billion invested in the space, right? Many in the later stages. So how is that? There is like sort of contradiction and when yeah. I'm talking nowadays, when I'm talking to uh, different investors, most of them are looking to deploy at least 10 million 
into the round, yeah. not including the pro rata. So coming in in the Series A or Series B, and the same thing, it's a market. So uh, we have many yeah. startups that their seed is already at five, their A is at uh, yeah. 20. And I'm asking, and I'm actually already answering the question that I wanted to ask you. How do you see the, you know, the the contradiction or the impact of Between the, the exits? Yeah. And and what we see as a few, especially as you are more of an early stage investor. Yeah. So so I would say I would say two things. Uh, one, not everything is as it seems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I think if you if you re- right if you're reading the you know the insure tech journal whatever it says oh my god most venture money in the world and it's true the numbers aren't false but two things are true one one out of every three dollars comes from a CVC these CVCs are not oriented towards financial returns so the fact that Root uh, Munich is more unhappy that Root did not turn out to be a good reinsurance risk than they are unhappy that the IPO did not perform. Mm-hmm. Right. The incentives of corporate carriers are very different. They want to deploy more uh, capital off their balance sheet as a risk ballast versus kind of financial return. So that's take away 33 percent of the funding numbers. And then if you take the remainder, because of what if you, get, if you remember what I said at the beginning, right, first generation insurance models are very capital intensive because they didn't do any product innovation. They're just going to go outspend Geico on digital marketing. Yeah. And so as a result of that, the later stage rounds have gotten larger and larger and larger. And, and my suspicion, I haven't done the math. I bet if you took the remaining 66%, something like 50% of it would have gone to 10% of the companies, the ones that are chewing up cash because they need to, right? Like Oscar raised a billion dollars, things of that nature. So I think if you actually go down to it, probably half the stated number, maybe even less than the half the stated number is actually going to early stage new company formations pre-seed through series B, building innovative things. And to me, that's actually quite exciting, mm-hmm. right? That means that there is a second generation of co- that is coming that's still underinvested, that people are going to be really, really excited about. Um, but I think that a lot of the capital that has gone into this space, even though the outcomes haven't been great, have really not cared about the outcomes being great, right? Folks who invest $300 million in a series D aren't looking for a 5X return. Mm-hmm. They're looking for 10% IRR because they're a, you know, public market investor that got it early. And so as all of us, like early ecosystem, people think about it, we're still in like the second inning. Um, We we still have kind of to figure out how to make these companies go, go public. And I think the pool of capital that's really focused on doing that is smaller than people believe it is. Who should reach out to you? (sighs) Anyone that loves insurance. (laughs) Um, So founders, operators, uh, other investors, people who, I think the folks I enjoy working with are folks who are optimistic about the role of insurance people's lives, but pessimistic about the path to get there. It is the hardest thing that I've ever worked on categorically in my life. And I find that the people who spend a lot of time in it have the same healthy pessimism about uh, how things work. But if you're an operator, if you work at a carrier, if you work at a reinsurer or broker, and you like talking about ideas that make your head hurt, and if you're a startup that decide you could have picked anything in the world to work on and you want to go solve insurance, you're, you're my type of person. I'd love to help in any way. Okay, let me ask you the last question that I'm asking everyone. Can you please give us a recommendation, a life hack, something that you picked up in the past two years or basically since COVID? A, a, a life recommendation or a more tangible Whatever recommendation? Whatever that may be. It can be a book, it can be a, a film or a life hack of how to manage the kids. Whatever works. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I, I would say so that I, I, true to form, I will, I will encourage folks to uh, watch a documentary. Um, there's a documentary on Netflix called 14 Peaks. And it's the story of a Nepalese uh, albinist. Mm-hmm. Uh, so someone who climbs mountains, uh, who is the first person to climb um, all 14 peaks that are over 8,000 meters. Um, The world record before him was seven years, and he did it in seven months. Um, And the concept, amongst many other things about like in social political things, is this notion of uh, when you hedge your goal to the goal of someone behind you or someone who came before you, you will only achieve incrementally more than that. 
when you fundamentally rethink what you want to do and where you want to go, you can achieve kind of incredible things. Um, and you know, it's not just in venture, right? It's in life generally as well. Um, once in a while, in certain categories of your life, you take huge swings and you stop anchoring to other people. Um, you just take a first principles approach to solving something and you might be wildly surprised like this person was, right? He beat his own goal by a year. <laughs> so it's a, it's a fascinating watch. It's really, really entertaining. Uh, but also pretty good. Fantastic. Vivek, thank you very, very much for joining me to do it today and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you.